cool. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Review Den. And this is it. Bonus content for the third game of Yu Suzuki's mighty 80s trio. The trifecta, my friends. Space Harrier, Outrun, and Afterburner 2. The superscalar games that set arcades on fire and put Sega on a distinct skyward trajectory in the video games industry. Sonic the Hedgehog landed on the Mega Drive in 1991 and was a smash hit but it was these three titles that lit the spark of Sega's success. So let's go ahead and look at some cool Afterburner bonus content, including, of course, the Ages 2500 release. Oh, and to set the table, again, for some of these ports, because Afterburner and Afterburner 2 were released within mere months of each other, many of the early ports mixed and matched some of the content between them. Some will have the original 18 levels, others the later 23. Mostly though, the differences come from the gameplay, so that's what I'll be focusing on. Trust me, I told you the Afterburner family tree is confusing. First up, let's look at the closest thing to an arcade-perfect port of the original Afterburner. A few early microcomputer ports and 8-bit systems tackled Afterburner 1, but these were limited by their hardware. The best, closest port was actually featured on the Game Boy Advance, which was also limited by hardware, but it is the closest thing we have outside of emulation. This was part of the Sega Arcade Gallery, a decent four-game collection. Now, this could have been an awesome pack of Sega classics, but it wasn't developed by Sega, and it does kind of show. The other games are a bit stripped down in presentation, and Afterburner is no different. Ground sprites are more sparse, the overall speed is slow, and the controls are a bit, uh, odd. You need to hold a shoulder button to move around at full speed, and you need to hold both shoulder buttons to barrel roll. The biggest knock against it, though, is the fact that it is Afterburner 1. Seriously, I can see why the game was updated within months of its original launch. If you never played the original, it is brutal. Enemy missiles seem to nail you from out of nowhere, while your own shots take forever to launch. Because of this, it almost pays to avoid offense altogether and play the entire game just dancing and dodging. Side by side, Afterburners 1 and 2 look so similar, but the differences under the hood are incredible. Games like these are meant to make you feel like a boss, a total ace against overwhelming odds, and Afterburner 1 was sort of the opposite of that, making this more of a curiosity, but it's worth noting nonetheless. Now, most of the early microcomputer ports all followed a similar formula, especially the Activision ones. These were all tailored to the hardware of each platform, but they followed the arcade template without any real frills or extras. A few, however, do stand out for adding a unique mini-boss throughout the game, and this seems to have originated on the Sega Master System. The Master System puts up a colorful, enjoyable port of the original Afterburner, though the gameplay is more forgiving. Enemies have large hitboxes, making your guns more useful, and you can shoot down incoming missiles. And the graphics use nice big sprites for the planes, especially compared to the NES ports. The interest here, though, is the mini-boss. The Flying Fortress, Grantinoff, shows up every few levels, firing multiple missiles at you while dodging around the screen. You'll need to destroy three weak points while avoiding enemy fire, and trust me, this is no easy feat. Now, the enemies in Afterburner are never actually defined, though they're assumed to be Soviet, more on that later, but the Grantinov is listed as a Tu-1000, which would make it a Russian Tupolev, while the name Grantinov became colloquial at Sega for extra content added to later releases. Just a bit of useless trivia there. The Fortress appears in the Commodore 64 release by Weeby Games, not the Activision release, and the MS-DOS release by Don Matrix, Distinctive Software, yes, that Don Matrix, Ooh, okay, well, we took each other out. I'll, I'll take that. And the Weeby Games Amiga release. The last one is strange, though, as it appears as, um, a jumbo jet? Not sure why they changed it. I hope that's not one of ours. I also doubt a big 747 could outrun a Tomcat, but hey, I'm not Weeby Games. Midair refueling is also made into a mini game in the Master System and Commodore releases, meaning you can actually miss out on rearming your plane. So that sucks. 
Okay, now this one is fun. The 3DS 3D Classic port is not only a stellar version of the original motion cabinets, but it includes a really fun new gameplay mode that was clearly inspired by Afterburner Climax. After completing the regular game, you unlock the special mode. Here, there are no continues and you'll always start from level one, but you now have access to burst mode. Taking out enemies will fill the meter and once activated, you'll go into bullet time and any enemies in front of you will automatically lock on. You can ripple off missiles at entire waves of enemies and if you do it right, you'll fill the meter back up just as burst mode ends, letting you repeat the process. By staying alive and using burst mode effectively, you'll earn tons of points and bonus lives and the challenge becomes racking up enough extra lives to make it through the game. I can't describe just how hectic this all is, but it is a great fun spin on the original game. It turns a game of survival into an absolute blastathon, and again, it makes me really wish Sega would bring this to the Switch or modern systems so modern gamers could enjoy it. Afterburner Climax is a fantastic game, and seeing some of its mechanics implemented in the original is a real treat. By the way, where did you men come from? Russia. Okay, now world building is a bit different. Unlike Space Harrier, which backfilled some of the game world in the Master System port, Afterburner never had any official story on where it takes place or who you're fighting, though this wasn't originally how the game was drafted. Yeah, there are a few hidden messages throughout the game, but these were mostly developer in-jokes. No, Yu Suzuki wanted the player to be making a journey into, yes, Russia, then extracting back to your carrier. The locations were supposed to be identifiable based on ground sprites, with prominent cities like St. Petersburg all represented. The problem was that while the new arcade hardware could push a ton of sprites at smooth frame rates, the memory required for each and every object was still quite large. Mapping out unique sprites for specific locations was still too taxing for such limited memory, and so each stage was just given a generic theme. Again, it was trying to take influence from Top Gun, but thanks to technical limitations, it's more up to the player's imagination. And finally, yes, we reach the Sega Ages 2500 release of Afterburner 2. Yeah, now this is fun. The new 3D visuals may not be revolutionary, but they are consistent, unlike OutRun, and keep to a fast 60 frames per second even when the screen is filled with chaos. This one doesn't add any new tricks to the stages. It's pretty much a like-for-like like with the original, just in 3D. The only new content here is the choice of three new planes. The A-10 sports an extra powerful cannon which can take out enemies more quickly. The F-117 Nighthawk, which is not a fighter, which I think faces fewer missiles thanks to its stealth. And my favorite, the Harrier, which is much more maneuverable and can dodge and juke around enemy fire much easier. Very cool. Although, I do apologize, I am gonna have to be that guy and point out that none of the three new planes actually have afterburners. In fact, they're known for being kind of slow. I'm sorry, I had to point it out, I'm sorry. Really though, it's hard to comment on Afterburner 2500 since what you see is what you get. It doesn't add any new stages and there's no new gameplay tricks like Space Harrier. It's just a totally competent 3D version of Afterburner 2, which is great. Which one you prefer is just down to the graphics. I will say that I think Sega missed an opportunity for the West though. The Sega Classics collection on PS2 had Columns and Tant R, which are both puzzle games, and neither of them really make use of 3D enhancements. Why they included these instead of Afterburner seems a really odd choice to me. I mean, they're fun too, but come on, this is friggin' Afterburner. I'm not sure if Sega considered it too difficult for modern gamers, or if the game presents emulation issues, but Afterburner 2 is strangely hard to find nowadays. Personally, I think it's the John Connor curse. Maybe if he hadn't been playing it in Terminator 2, we'd have Afterburner in every Sega Ages compilation. Really though, Space Harrier, Outrun, and Afterburner were Sega's big three in the 80s arcades, and they helped set the tone and mood for Sega's console games of the 90s. I just wish they would bring back Afterburner Climax. Thank you all so much for watching. I may not always be able to, to do deep dives into games like this, but these three were really enjoyable to me. Always feel welcome to leave any comments below, maybe good memories you had of these games, and would you be my next subscriber? I'll be back soon with another review, and as always, be sure to keep going. You are worth it.